So welcome every, everybody. Uh, this is our fifth session of the Humanity and Healthcare series. Uh, and it's a real uh, pleasure to have all of you here with us, uh, but especially Dr. Hugh Wiley and Dr. Sue Moffat. Um, we're gonna be talking about finding solutions together uh, after spinal cord injury, uh, both a patient and a physician's lived experience. Um, Lots, lots to get to. I, um, I will keep moving here. So um, as we come together, it's really important to acknowledge that this is both a safe and inclusive environment and that we live, work and play uh, on uh, a territory that is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and uh, Haudenosaunee uh, territory. Uh, and it's a great privilege for us to to be here and uh, share and work and play together. Um, our planning committee for this series has no specific disclosures or conflicts of interest uh, for this session. And uh, although it's been approximately a year now that we've been doing Zoom chats and Zoom teaching and Zoom almost everything, just a reminder that um, uh, please use your mute button uh, so to limit background noise, feel free to leave your video on. It's always nice uh, to see faces, but feel free to uh, stop your video um, if you so desire or feel emotional at any time. Um, and please do use the chat function. We have a few breaks uh, for uh, questions and uh, open discussion, uh, both in the middle and towards the end um, of the session tonight. And we really uh, encourage you to uh, write your comments and chats and, and questions in there. And so without much further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our two speakers tonight that um, the three of us are going to have uh, an open conversation together with the help of a few slides. Uh, Dr. Hugh Wiley, um, who's immediately to my right uh, on the, the Zoom uh, squares here has recently become uh, one of my new friends over the last few months. He is uh, just uh, just such a lovely uh, man, uh, a proud dad, a dedicated husband, uh, a very talented and well-respected veterinarian, uh, an outdoor enthusiast. And um, for this talk, we're gonna talk about Hugh also being uh, a, a patient who has suffered a, a spinal cord injury. Our second speaker is, uh, or conversationalist, I should say, is uh, Dr. Sue Moffat, who, uh, as she has written, is a curious clinician. She is a medical teacher, a grateful wife, and a lucky mother. Uh, I've had the privilege to work with Sue as a colleague and as a trainee, as a, a fellow educator. She has supervised me, taught me, uh, and uh, it's nice to say that uh, uh, Sue is uh, a great friend of, of mine too. So um, it's with great delight that we um, are going to have this talk with each other. So to start us off, I thought that we would um, share a few pictures from Hugh's family album. You can see on your left, uh, Hugh is uh, quite an accomplished athlete. I believe last week he told me, uh, Sue and I, that he ran his first marathon in grade 10, um, was an avid triathlete and, and very, uh, very active. Uh, there he is uh, on the right side at a family holiday in Mont Tremblant uh, with his oldest, his daughter, Alex. Um, and, you know, that picture on the right, you correct me if I'm wrong, but that would be somewhere around 1998, 1999. I believe that was the year I got into vet school, Damon. So that, okay. was, that was, um, once I got into vet school, I thought I would, uh, I dedicate that year to my running again because I that took a bit of a pass when I was studying. Yeah. So that's the what they used to call it 
the Skyline Marathon, which is now the Niagara Mar Marathon. Right. And that's um, one of those, a pre-race for a qualifier for the Boston Marathon. Right. So we take a bus over to Niagara, um, or Buffalo, New York, or run to Niagara Falls, Ontario. And in that race, I qualified for the Boston Marathon that year. Wow. So I actually kind of overdid it with my <laughs> running that year. And my, mar my marks suffered somewhat at school. I think I went a little bit overboard because I was happy once I got in and all you had to do was maintain a passing grade. But some of the courses that year were a little bit poor, but I was able to get through that year and run the Boston Marathon. Very good. Um, we were just talking before we started, uh, this is a picture from a family wedding with your, with your wife, uh, Kelly. So um, we're, um, so at that time, before your injury, which was the year 2000, you were uh, a proud father of your daughter, Alex, married to Kelly. You worked at the Kingston Veterinary Clinic. And the picture on the right here is a picture of one of the lanes down to a cabin that you um, had and enjoyed in Westport. And, uh, you know, this is where, where you and family and friends would spend a lot of time, downtime, uh, when you weren't at work or at home living in Odessa. And, um, and this is a place where your life changed. Um, one night when you were out at the cabin, you, you fell. Uh, and for everybody who's here, um, Hugh fell backwards about 12 feet and uh, struck his head and neck. And, um, and then, as I said, thing, things were very different. Hugh, can I ask you to tell us what happened after you fell, how you felt, and, and how you got to the hospital? So, Damon, when I fell, I was... I actually fell on my head. I was concussed. So I don't remember exactly what happened, but I'm told by my friends that were up there with me that I fell and they put me on a mattress and they were uh, well versed in their you know, uh, emergency training. So they did stabilize my neck and they put me on a mattress, then carried me in a pickup truck to Devil Lake Road, where I was met by an ambulance. They went, another friend came with me to KGH where I, um, yeah, I was met by the emergency people there and at, I have a recollection of being in uh, an elevator going upstairs. And uh, I think I asked the question, do you think I could be paralyzed? And the, whoever it was said, yes, that's a possibility. Yeah. And a lot of the rest of that, Damon, is not clear in my mind. Um, because so there was a... Uh, I think between the the fall and the concussion and the degree of trauma, it was yeah. a lot to really uh, remember. Really. So, Hugh, I, I thank you for that. Um, I thought I might help situate um, all of the other people who have attended the session that. You would have arrived by ambulance in a C-spine collar on a backboard and been greeted by a trauma team, so an interdisciplinary medical, nursing, respiratory therapy team um, who would have stabilized you. 
you were awake during this whole period. You did not have a breathing tube in. You were concussed, but awake. Um, you went to the, the CAT scanner uh, and they saw a significant spinal cord injury um, within your cervical spine. And then, um, and then you were taken to the ICU um, where um, the ICU team uh, helped care for you. And then four days later, you went for uh, surgery on your neck to, to stabilize your neck over the long term. The, um, this is a picture from the ICU. And I thought at this point that I might invite Dr. Moffat, Sue, to um, uh, tell us a little bit about those first days, weeks, and, and, and onwards um, about her first, her first impressions of caring for you. Hi, Hugh. Hi, Kelly, um, Hi, and any other family people uh, that I can't see on the gallery. Um, so this is a picture taken of you, I would guess probably in about February and you were injured in November. And it illustrates some of the things that were involved in helping you get better. And I'm just gonna focus on a few of the issues because I learned so much from, from you and with you and one of the themes of our session today is finding solutions. And I'd just like to focus on a few of the problems we dealt with and some of the solutions we found and some of the ups and downs in getting there. Um, the biggest problem was after you had your surgery, you couldn't breathe on your own. And we didn't know why. We had expected you would be able to. And it turned out, we learned with the help of a neurologist and um, and my colleague, Dr. Fitzpatrick, that in addition to your spinal cord injury, you would had a selective injury of your phrenic nerve, which is the nerve that runs your uh, diaphragm, the big muscle that helps us breathe. And your left side uh, didn't work. And so you were basically breathing with only one lung and that didn't give you the strength to breathe all day. You could breathe for short periods of time and uh, you couldn't cough. And so um, after a week of trying to take a breathing tube out of your mouth, we did the procedure that you can see here that, which was called the tracheostomy and put the breathing tube into your windpipe directly. And that was good because uh, you can see you don't have any stuff in your face, um, but you hated it and you couldn't talk and you were still attached to a machine. We didn't know how to help you. And I called Doug McKim, who was a colleague of mine in Ottawa and ran the rehab program there and asked him to come down and do a consultation and, and help us. And he brought his whole team and gave excellent advice. And while he was here, he taught all of the RTs, respiratory therapists at KGH and at St. Mary's of the Lake um, and uh, our physiotherapists, the techniques that they used in their rehab center to help people with your problem. And we have used those ever since on every ICU patient, patients with other neuromuscular conditions. And what we learned with you has helped hundreds if not thousands of other people. But in the short run, we were interested in helping you. It took five months for you to learn how to breathe on your own. Countless terrifying episodes where you couldn't breathe. And your courage in getting through that was, was really amazing. But it wasn't until you got to St. Mary's in March that we actually were able to have you breathe on your own all day and all night and you have ever since with some help. So that was a really big problem. About and it took a long time to fix and a lot of help. And as you'll hear in my other solutions, um, it's, uh, it turns out it's more a matter of, it's not uh, what you know, it's who you know, because the rest of the situations all got fixed with collaboration too. Um, you had, um, because of the spinal cord injury, when you sat up, you fainted. And we tried with the nurses, umpteen medications to help you and ever so slowly, over a period of months, you were able to sit up at a higher and higher uh, level so that you could ultimately live, um, use a wheelchair. The nurses um, 
it, uh, it was an army of people that helped uh, you and us learn how to manage your skin, your bladder, your bowel, all the things that before some, your, your brain did automatically for you. And I think the most important uh, person in people in this picture, aside from you, uh, are, are Kelly and Alex, who came every day. And Kelly and, and Alex never didn't seem to notice that you were in bed. And, and Kelly was absolutely, I can't express my uh, admiration for her and the example she set of just, we're gonna get this done. And so over a matter, um, a matter of five months, we started to get you ready to go to St. Mary's. Um, I could have mentioned many other people who helped you. In this transition, uh, we needed to collaborate now with St. Mary's. And although they are a rehab facility, they weren't used to looking after someone with your needs. So we, uh, uh, Dr. Karen Smith, who ran the program, came over here or over to KGH and brought her team to get to know you. And we went, and then you went over there for progressively longer little visits, two hours, four hours, half a day. And, um, it, and we taught each other how to um, look after you safely um, during that transition with the ultimate success being that you were able to um, breathe on your own for, uh, for the whole, for a day and uh, to get a little bit of help at night with a machine similar to what people with sleep apnea use. Um, so those were some of the problems that we found solutions for. And I didn't know, uh, Damon, did you want to talk about um, some of the, those are the ups, some of the downs? Are you asking me, Sue, or? I was asking Damon, I wasn't sure where, when he wanted us to discuss that it wasn't easy. Yeah, so, you know, um, Hugh, Sue just walked us through some of those initial weeks and months and, and ultimately over to St. Mary's. I'm wondering if, if you could speak to a few of the things that Sue might have touched on um, or that you would like to sort of talk about in, in um, some of the, the, the many challenges in those first few days? Oh, the first few days, I, I remember vividly struggling to breathe and not being able to speak well. It was so difficult to let everybody know that I was short of breath. I know as Sue mentioned, the thought of getting up, I dreaded the thought of getting up every day because I knew there's a good chance I might faint, but you had to keep doing that. And we tried all types of different medication to try to increase my blood pressure so I wouldn't faint, but there were times when I did and as Sue said, they were, I think the nurses that were caring for me, they used to dread it as well because they knew there's a good chance I might faint. I think also dealing with the loss of the physical part of my body was huge for me because that was one thing that I really that was extremely important to me. Like that was um, next to my veterinary medicine, my running and physical stuff, I really took great pride in and that was all gone. And knowing that Kelly was pregnant and I had a young daughter and my son was on the way, I didn't know how to. I wasn't ever sure how to be a good father. But I soon, you start to realize you don't have a lot of choice in this and you have to carry on. And more and more you realize, 
I think even a doctor told me that a lot of the parenting is in the mind and not at the physical part. And after a while, they don't really care if you're running around with them. They just want you to be there with them. But that was a huge concern of mine, how I was going to be a good father and a good husband to my wife, Kelly, who obviously lost a lot as well with this accident. Thanks, Hugh. Um, Hugh, when you moved over to St. Mary's of the Lake after a number of months at KGH. Um, what were you, were you looking forward to that? Were you hesitant? How were you feeling with the, the transition to that hospital, to a new care environment out of an intensive care environment to a, a different uh, environment of care? Oh, I think it was, it's all built to be the next step going forward. So I was looking forward to it. Again, thanks to Dr. Moffitt and Karen Smith, they had arranged to have RTs come over to St. Mary's at night to slowly wean me off my ventilator. And after about a week or so of them being there, they had set up a nice, kind of call bell or an alarm system on my ventilator. So that if I had problems, I could alert an RT. And the transition from my ventilator to the BiPAP went surprisingly smoothly. I think that's, as I'm told, I recruited new muscles to breathe. So slowly after about five months, my breathing did get stronger. And I still, to this day, very grateful for my physical activity prior to my accident because my pulmonary function was exceptional before my accident. I think that certainly helped me going through. Mm -hmm. But again, there were so many people that had researched this and help me wean off the ventilator onto the BiPAP machine. So the transition was smoother and I learned how to transition from being an able-bodied person to kind of an actor, a relatively stable quadriplegic. Hugh, you had, you had mentioned um, that in the last picture that Kelly was about four to five months pregnant when you had your injury. Yeah. And um, you were in the ICU and then we just talked about going over to St. Mary's of the Lake. Um, tell us about the, the team that got you to Connell Five to be with Kelly for the birth of your son, Jack, who you're holding in this picture. So that again was organized by, I believe Sue and Karen Smith, and the people that knew me from ICU knew my potential to have that orthostatic hypotension. So Sue arranged a team from ICU to look after me and I was taking my quality patient transfer over to KGH and my sister-in-law was there to you know, take Jack from Kelly's room. And then I was there and it was a scheduled C-section at 11 o'clock on April the 17th of 2001. And it all went quite smoothly because I was an IV and Kelly was looked after. And then I went up to the room to be with Kelly and I had people looking after me and Kelly had people looking after her and my mother and father are there. And then um, I was able to hold Jack and I would go back to St. Mary's that night and then come back the following morning. I think I did that for two days. And then uh, after that, I stayed at 
St. Mary's of the Lake after that. So Hugh and Sue, um, I thought that this might be a good spot to sort of take a, a pause um, and see if there are any sort of comments or questions from uh, the other uh, people who are here with us. Damon, I'm just going to jump in and say if people want to don't feel comfortable to unmute, they can pop their questions or comments in the chat as well. You, you and I have known each other for a number of years now, and I'm struck as I, I hear you share your story today. And I wrote down a few things here. You, you're talking about dealing with the loss of the physical body. And I'm just wanting to hear from you about, you know, as you formed a new self-concept for yourself, because running and, and physical activity was such a central part of yourself. Say that again, Catherine, please. I was just struck, Hugh, you talked about, you know, you were dealing with the loss of your physical body right after the injury. And as you developed a new self-concept for yourself, because that was such a key portion of your identity, you know, how did you move forward in that way after the accident? Well, I think you have to accept the fact that you're different, Catherine. I did try to do as much as I could. I do have an exercise bike that I use every day. I did have a stand-up frame that I would get into every day. I tried to maintain my physical fitness as well as I could. But I think you have to accept the fact that your body is different fairly soon or you're not going to do well. So I think with the help of my father and a lot of other people, you just realize that it's different now and try to find other things that you can find enjoyment with. And as long as I could get outside and go for a wheel or do something outside, I think I was relatively happy, but that part was tough, but uh, I think I realized fairly soon that I'd have to change all that and just start to lead a different life. Hi, could I, it's Dave Andrew, could I? Um, yes, please go ahead. Hey Huey, how are you doing? I'm well, Dave, how are you? Good, I've known Huey for I think about uh, 25 years and we used to do triathlons together. I basically would always see his back way off in the distance because he was so smoking fast. It was ridiculous. He was an incredible athlete. Well, he's still an amazing person. I got to say that um, I, <clears throat> I do recall one thing early on you know, when I, just after I heard about Huey's in, injury, um, his dad, who's an MD, asked me if I would go and speak to him because he knew I was a neuroscientist. So this was only a day or so after Huey's injury. I got to say, it was one of the more difficult things I, I think I had to uh, I had to, to do. Um, I went in and there was Huey, and his dad had asked me to maybe say something positive about positive about neuroscience research and where it was going, and maybe you know provide some positive input. Well. That's 20 years ago. There hasn't been a huge amount of uh, uh, advancement in terms of helping people with spinal cord injuries, obviously, in the neurosciences. In fact, there hasn't been a lot of advancement in helping anybody in the neurosciences clinically. Um, it turns out the brain and spinal cord are pretty complicated. But I did talk to Huey, and I, he might not even remember, I'm not sure, but um, I, I kind of put out some positive vibes about how spinal cord research was moving, moving forward. And that who knows, maybe in the future, you know, there might be some, uh, some relief, but uh, I gotta say, Huey, you're just uh, I mean, 25 years later and here we are 20 years later anyway, here we are. And uh, I think your athleticism has really served you well as you've already pointed out. 
Thank hey. you, Dave. I do remember those times favorably. I don't, don't think you're as slow as you make yourself out to be because I still see you running out there all the time. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Hi, you. It's Elliot here. I just uh, was wanting to ask you just a question, uh, sort of a quality of life question about, uh, you know, how you're feeling today after all these years. Uh, how's your quality of life and uh, any comments on any sort of dips or valleys along the way with your, your some of your uh, health concerns uh, in terms, just in terms of your quality of life? Oh, Elliot, as you know, more than anybody, I've had huge dips in my quality of life. I think the thing that has improved most for me is my, my autonomic dysreflexia. For me, I would get some of the really high blood pressure parts, but the thing that affected my quality of life the most was, I call it the sweats. I, for so many years, I was, I was wet all the time. And that, that was very difficult to deal with, especially in the winter months, because you never ever felt comfortable when you're cold and wet. And I, when I got wet from some kind of autonomic dysfunction, that would change my persona, my well-being so much. I was, I often became, I would be miserable. I, I, I wasn't a happy camper. And I think you saw that a lot Anybody that knows me, when I got wet, I was a different person. But I believe my, my bladder management is different. I now have what they call a super pubic catheter. So touch wood for a year and a half, I've been dry. And that alone just is great. And the other thing, thanks to the help of my respirologist, I, I've taken these nebulizers that certainly helped my chest a lot and I feel like I can vocalize now so much better than I used to and I, I don't get these respiratory problems I used to. And then I think of you know, a pressure sore that I, I got from someone sliding an x-ray plate down my backside like three years ago that took a long time and that's healed. So even though I'm still a quadriplegic touch what I don't have any of the issues that I should be have, having after 20 years and feeling this well after 20 years, I wasn't really expecting, but yeah, everything physically, well, I say that I'm still a par a paralyzed, but everything is working well. So I'm quite happy about that. And my family life is great. And I have a lot of, you know, good friends and I do have a very strong director I have a lot of family support, put it that way. My sisters and my wife and my family, they've all been great. So just feeling well really is the main goal of a quadriplegic and I feel well right now. And, and Hugh, I'm just turning to the chat here. Heather Murray has a question and she first says, thank you for sharing your story and wondering if you could tell me some of the small things that you remember the healthcare providers doing that was helpful for you. I'm going to say initially, but you know, you have a lot of ongoing interactions with the healthcare system, and you know, what's been helpful from a provider's perspective to share with the, the many of us on the call here. Oh, I would say the um, 
The respirology part was huge. The bladder management, that was a real game changer. I see well, I've dealt with Karen Smith for 20 years and she's overseen so many aspects of my care. I've seen pretty well every specialist in the city and they've all been wonderful. And all the nurses and even the attendants that I've had here in my house have been well, but I think it's, yeah, there's so many, Catherine, but the chest and the bladder and the skin have all been the most beneficial. See, we've got one more hand up, but I'm going to pass it on, Damon, to you, and, and we'll circle back at the end if that's okay for others who, who might have some questions. I'll pass it over to you again, Hugh, and Damon and Sue. Okay. Um... So Hugh, um, you know, we, we talked about the beginning and we, um, I'd like to talk about in the end and more recently, but I'd like to talk about the middle part somewhat. Um, this is a lovely picture of, of part of your home. Um, and you, Sue and I have talked for a little while about the, the transition home uh, and just the uh, complexities and logistics of uh, because you live out in Odessa um, when you had your accident uh, and you built a house and moved in town so I was I was hoping that you could share with us um, sort of the, the time of moving home and how that happened how you're able to make that happen the house is actually an inverary David but oh, oh sorry I, 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 I um I would have to give Kelly 90% of the credit for that. I was in the hospital and trying to deal with my injury. So I had to sell my house out in Mount Chesney to get funding to build this new house. So we purchased a lot on Moat Avenue and we had a builder build this house and he started, once we sold my property in Mount Chesney, we were able to purchase the property and start building my home on Moat Avenue. But in, at the same time, I had to purchase an air mattress, which I still own. I had to purchase a wheelchair accessible van. I had to purchase a commode chair. Um, I had to arrange attendant care, which I did through Karen Smith and our fellow called Neil Allen at the Center for Independent, Independent Living. So I hired attendants when I was at St. Mary's to help me going forward when I arrived in Moat Avenue. Um, but Kelly did most of that because I would come periodically, I'd wheel down once I got my power wheelchair, I'd wheel down to have a look at the house, but that was all arranged by the builder and Kelly PM. And she was also pregnant with Jack. So, I mean, that was, and she seemed to do it so effortlessly, she effortless, effortlessly, because she never, she just did it and got it done. And it would have been overwhelming for a lot of people. Yeah. It, so speaking of a lot of people, um, this is a picture of, of your family, I should tell everybody, uh, your parents uh, are in the middle there. And, and are all five of your sisters in this picture, Hugh? Is that? I think we're missing one, my sister Bridget. Okay, okay. Um, 
with the time remaining here, I was I was hoping um, we could spend a little bit uh, talking about um, being a dad. You mentioned it about 20 minutes ago. We have a couple more pictures here about how, um, and you and I spent some time talking about this before, um, how your injury uh, altered your interaction with your kids and, and the joy um, of being at Jack's hockey tournaments and Alex's activities. I'm wondering if you could um, uh, talk about the last 18 to 20 years of, of being a dad. Well, I think the best part is that I got to spend a lot of time with my children. And for the first, both my son Jack and my daughter Alex were involved in a lot of sports stuff. So I, I went to all their activities. I got to enjoy their growing up. And as much as I loved my veterinary profession, I found I spent a lot of time away from my, from my family. I didn't get to see Alex very much at all when she was growing up because I didn't get back from work until about six or seven, but, and with my attendance, I was able to go most to most of Jack hockey tournaments and Alex's hockey tournaments and soccer tournaments and soccer games. So it's been, I've been lucky to have very good attendance. And when I couldn't go there, I had to have friends take me in my, accessible van to watch their stuff. So I was lucky to see them growing up and I still have to get to see them and talk to them every day. So that that role as a father has been huge to me and you, I guess in some ways you change your role from you being the, the money maker to the father. And I think that's important in this day and age I don't think you can have two people working too much because I think the kids, they are jeopardized somewhat. And when I think of my two partners, they didn't get to spend that time with the children that I got to. So that's, if there is a blessing in spinal cord injuries that you have time to spend with your children and your wife and your friends as well. So yeah. things change, but there are some things that I enjoy. I hate it on call. I think I'll, I don't think anybody in the world enjoys on call, but especially a large animal on call, that would, that would certainly ruin your evening and hour if you got a bad call, but that would apply to you too. Anybody in some of these things take a lot of your time, but I certainly okay. have enjoyed you know, the last 20 years with my children. Yeah, thanks for that, Hugh. Um, I was gonna say something, a, a lot of us have carried pagers and, and been on call, but I'm not sure that anybody else in this group has ever done large animal call. I, I'm pretty sure none, none, of, none of us have. Um, you know, it sounds lovely in the James Harriet days, but when you get a call at two o'clock in the morning, you have to go to Amherst Island for a cab, and your heart just drops. <laughs> <laughs> that, that gives you know, me a whole new perspective of going out, into a merge in the night. C section, and it's going to be a long night. Then you have to go back to work the next day. So it's. Yeah. My wife would laugh, but I would make sure I cuddle her when I got back into bed. Yeah, um, Hugh. A lot of people aren't necessarily aware during this conversation that you've been up until last spring. You you worked continue to work as a veterinarian um, quite regularly. So in addition to all the, the time you talked about being able to spend more time with Alex and Jack, that you, you also um, worked as a, as a much loved vet. I have many, many friends uh, who, who would not see any other veterinarian other than you. Um, can you describe for everybody how, um, how you managed to um, continue your profession 
uh, dis despite being um, despite your injury? Oh, I was lucky because I had a, an exceptional veterinary technician who would help me with, she would do the physical exam and she and I would discuss how we're going to, how we're going to treat this animal, whether we need a blood work or an x-ray or whether we could just treat the animal, the cat or a dog on an outpatient basis. So I would work three days a week, only until three o'clock. And I always said I was the happiest veterinarian going because I only worked three hours a day and I could leave whenever I wanted and I didn't have any on call. And I did have, I really enjoyed the, the social interaction with my clients because they always asked me how I was doing and how my kids were doing. And I got, rather than seeing someone every 15 minutes, I was a lot of half an hour. So it really was fairly straightforward. The only thing that ever really bothered me when I was working was that a, a lot of the time I did have my autonomic symptoms. So I'd often be wet, but again, my, my vet technician, Jackie helped me a lot. I, she used to give me, I had a, what's called a breast stacking bag in my backpack and a blow dryer in the drawer in the bottom of that picture. So she would drive me off in between clients, but it all worked well. And at three o'clock I could go home and yeah, things were great. And I, I would almost say I enjoyed it more than I did when I was just working those long days. It was a, a nice, a nice way to kind of break up the day and see clients and do something that I felt was somewhat valuable to the, my clients. I think most of them appreciated my advice as well. And they're really appreciating, appreciated Jackie for everything she did for me as well. Yeah. Um, Hugh and Sue, we, we have about uh, 10 minutes left of the formal session and then uh, for those that want to stay we're, we have time for more uh, chat and questions um, uh, afterwards. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, thinking back and reflecting on and lessons learned and, and challenges um, amongst the group of us in preparing for this and, and I was hoping that um, we could spend some time now um, to talk about that. Uh, Hugh, this is uh, a, a more uh, most recent picture of the four of you, uh, Kelly and Jack and Alex. Um, it's, it's a lovely picture for so many reasons. Um, I'm going to ask Sue to um, start uh, and just talk about some of the things that um, she's been thinking about uh, and wants to, sh to share with you. Well, Hugh, um, you know that I hesitated to do this with you. Um, it's been 20 years since I worked with you practically every day. Um, but I want to thank you and Damon for uh, inviting me to have this opportunity to reflect on what was really one of the most rewarding and difficult uh, aspects of my work in ICU. When I cared for you, I'd been an intensivist for 15 years and I was the director of the ICU. That gave me a lot of access to people to help. And I hope in describing how some of your problems were solved, um, people recognize the uh, respect and appreciation uh, and the tremendous teamwork that, that it took. Um, hi, Kelly. Um, the, um, I think you and I talked about how it was important to be honest about some of the difficult times. Um, and, and if it be okay, I know you and I have mentioned this, but I'd like to mention three feelings that I had to deal with that might resonate with other people. And that would be uh, fear and frustration and fatigue. 
when I first knew you were in ICU, I was there the first day you came in. People got to sign up for who they wanted to look after. And I was afraid to look after you because it was too close to home. I'm only a few years older than you. My kids are only a few years older than you. And looking at you in your bed was looking at something I was terrified of in my own life. And uh, one of the things I learned from working with you is not to avoid those hard situations. But I was afraid. I was afraid to be you and I was afraid if my husband were you. Um, and we got frustrated, both of us did. We got frustrated with problems. I like to fix things and I couldn't fix your big problem. And it, it was easier to go look after somebody who had a littler problem. But I learned from you that you never asked to walk again. You just asked to be, feel a little bit better the next day. And you and I learned that we couldn't fix the big problem, but we could fix a whole series of little ones. And we made progress. And you helped me uh, be satisfied with what could be done and not what I wish I could do. You and I are stubborn and we had to learn to respect each other. I see Kate, I see Kelly nodding. Um, most patients in ICU can't talk or express their wishes. I, I could lip read you. Um, and um, sometimes I wanted to close my eyes, uh, but um, you and I had to negotiate everything, right? And I learned to respect what you said, and you learned to try what I asked you. And uh, we had ups and downs, but we came to be good, respectful partners. And one of the things you said when we were practicing, uh, not practicing, but talking together before this was um, how important it was that people listened to you. And you're a pioneer now. You, you have outlived the life expectancy for people with your injury by many years. And you have problems that most people have never seen. And you will continue to teach people. And we all have to be curious and, and, and listen to you. But there were times that I got tired. That's the fatigue part. I just wanted to walk away. I wanted it to be not my problem, but I never could because Kelly never quit and you never quit. So I couldn't quit. And I want to thank you for um, keeping me from quitting on you. Um, and, and you inspired me 20 years ago you taught me that I have no idea what other people are capable of. I can help people to plan for, prepare for what could happen. And what I've learned from you has helped me prepare hundreds of other patients since I met you. And I can help them plan. And you've taught me so much about, and we learned through you, how to plan for so many other patients with similar situations. But I cannot predict what someone can do with their uh, courage and strength. And right now when we're all kind of tired of a year of the pandemic and a year of one damn thing after another and tired of finding, so getting new problems and half-baked solutions, I think hearing you tonight has really helped me and I think maybe other people listening um, to um, appreciate just the determination of just doing one more day um, accomplishes. And I, I wanna thank you for 20 years ago and, and for now. And uh, I really have appreciated this time together. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Sue. Um, Hugh or Kelly, hi, hi, Kelly. Um, did you wanna say something back to Sue? Uh, well, I'm pretty touched. Um, we've seen each other over the years, but uh, you know, first time I've heard some of those words. So 
Uh, it, it really touches me. Um, I think it touches you as well. Um, and it makes me feel pretty good. Um, I think of Hugh as a pioneer. I don't know if I use those words, but I love it. I'll have to get him a t-shirt now. <laughs> um, but uh, I think of him that way. And I, I know that he demonstrates that every day. And uh, I, I'm pretty impressed and, and pretty inspired that, that he could have inspired people um, that, that he was, you know, had to, to work with, like people like Sue and everybody since then. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's a pretty good outcome for a situation that I, I don't think when, when it first happened, we, we ever thought of positive outcomes. But I will put that in the big bucket of very positive things that have happened in our life since then. So I'm just going to jump in and say, I think that we've all been given a gift tonight, um, a, a gift of, of not only Hugh's experience and that of your families, but of that of what it's like to, to care for a person who has injuries that we can think of in a variety of different ways, but yet perseveres through them and is persistent. And it just comes to me of the, the power of how uh, the desire to be here, the desire to overcome something means we can do it together. And you, uh, the work that um, Susan has done with you has created a bond that not everybody gets. And maybe there's lots of things people haven't shared. The times when you wanted to say enough is enough or the times that you've you know, stubbornly said, I can keep going. But as a healthcare provider, all of us with our respective competencies and the ways that we work all need to be reminded that if we're there to do it together, we can help people get through a variety of things. And um, my goodness, family is super important. And you're pretty blessed to, to have the people that you have with you in your life to move this through. So thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, this experience tonight. And Susan, for sharing with us um, your experience, because equally all persons in the context of our practices matter. And it's really nice to hear it all. So thank you. Thanks, Serna, for that. Um, so it's six o'clock. We, um, what we'd like to do is end the formal part of the session, but we can uh, continue on for another 10, 15, uh, 20 minutes to keep chatting and, and talking to each other. There's a question from before that uh, somebody had their hand up that we weren't able to get to in a few chats uh, right now.